Our scripture passage today is taken from the Gospel of Luke from the Message Bible. In this, in this passage, Jesus and his disciples are heading for Jerusalem for the last time. And there's just really a great deal of frustration in this passage. A couple different things happen. One is that um, a couple of guys are sent out ahead of them to see if they can get some hospitality from the Samaritan village, and they're turned down. And the other thing is that Jesus then has an encounter with three different people on the road who are genuinely interested in following him, and he rebukes them. It's very odd. And so, out of respect for the gospel, would you please stand? Our gospel lesson today is taken from Luke chapter 9, verses 51 through 62, from the message. When it came close to the time for his ascension, he gathered up his courage and steeled himself for the journey to Jerusalem. He sent messengers on ahead. They came to a Samaritan village to make arrangements for his hospitality. But when the Samaritans learned that his destination was Jerusalem, they refused hospitality. When the disciples James and John learned of it, they said, Master, do you want us to call a bolt of lightning down out of the sky and incinerate them? Jesus turned on them, of course not. And they traveled on to another village. On the road, someone asked if he could go along. I'll go with you wherever, he said. Jesus was curt. Are you ready to rough it? We're not staying in the best inns, you know. Jesus said to another, follow me. He said, certainly, but first excuse me for a couple of days, please. I have to make arrangements for my father's funeral. Jesus refused. First things first, your business is life, not death, and life is urgent. Announce God's kingdom. Then another said, I'm ready to follow you, master, but first excuse me while I get things straightened out at home. Jesus said, no procrastination, no backward looks. You can't put God's kingdom off till tomorrow. Seize the day. You may be seated. Manchester United Methodist Church is a big church. It's not a mega church, but it's a big church. We have more than 3,300 members. And uh, when, when you look at uh, membership, our church is the largest United Methodist Church in the state of Missouri. The thing is, churches really aren't, the size of a church isn't really gauged by membership <clears throat> anymore. It's gauged by membership attendance. And when you look at that, there's actually a couple of other United Methodist churches in the state of Missouri who um, have greater attendance than we do with uh, less members, which is kind of troubling. But at the same time, we come in third. So we're still, <laughs> we're still a big church. We're still a big church. In um, the mid-'80s, when I first moved to the St. Louis area, I was newly married and just had uh, you two are absolutely welcome to walk around with your child if you want to, and I'm not putting you on the spot at all. I just want you to know we're really casual up here, so if you need to get up and walk around, feel free to do that, okay? All right. I mean, I remember what that's like. So in the mid-'80s, I came here. I was newly married. I had a, a, a new degree, and we had jobs here. And um, I, had, I had grown up with a family that always belonged to a church but very rarely attended. And the man I married, my then husband, had grown up with a family that uh, attended a United Methodist Church every Sunday. And he went to youth every Wednesday. And so when we got here and we moved into this area, it made all kinds of sense to him that we join a Methodist church. Well, I didn't care. I didn't care. My family pretty much went to church on Easter and Christmas and just a few times in between the holidays. So if it was important to him, that was fine. So we looked at a couple of different Methodist churches in the area, and this was the second one we looked at. And the first time we came here, I knew this was where, if we were going to join a Methodist church, I wanted it to be this one. And there were two reasons for that. 
One was that at that time in the mid 80s, John Ward, who is our pastor emeritus, was the preaching pastor, the senior pastor. And he just had a really nice way about him. I'd never heard anybody preach like that before. He was very engaging and very warm and very welcoming. And for somebody like me who really knew very little about the Bible, about God, or even what I, you know, even about the Christian faith, there was really something for me to grab hold of in his sermons. And at the same time, I think his sermons worked on a couple of levels. Because you know, in any United Methodist Church of any size, you've got people like I was at that time. And all the way to the other end of the spectrum, retired pastors. We have a lot of retired pastors in this church. And so you got to be talking on a number of levels, you know? And I absolutely think that John did. He was engaging. He was warm. His stuff was thoughtful. And I left with something to think about, which I really appreciated. I'd, I'd never heard preaching like that before. And so that was one of the reasons why. If we were going to join a United Methodist Church, if I had to come to worship, at least I wanted the sermons to be good, right? But you know what? I said there were two reasons why, and, and that was not the main reason. It was, don't tell John. But that was not the main reason. The main reason was that this was a big church. Even at that time, this was a big church. In the mid-80s, the 1,200 seat sanctuary didn't exist. That was built in 1998. And the sanctuary that was at that time is what we now call Fellowship Hall with the basketball hoops and where we have Wednesday night dinner. And you know, you might think compared to a 1,200 seat sanctuary that Fellowship Hall doesn't really look that big. You fill that Fellowship Hall with pews and you fill those pews with people and you better believe, compared to a lot of churches, this was a big church. And I swear, there were people, not only in there, but in the hallways. We were shoulder to shoulder, and the rooms were full. There were just people everywhere. Now, some people want to join a big church for all the big church has to offer. All the faith formation opportunities and, and just all kinds of good stuff. That, that, that wasn't why. That wasn't why. I like the idea that this was a big church because I could remain anonymous. I knew that I could slip into worship and slip back out again, and nobody would know the difference. And I liked that idea. Now, the thing, the thing is, you might be surprised how many people join a church the size of Manchester United Methodist Church because they want to remain anonymous. But it's for a lot of different reasons, a lot of different reasons. And I'll tell you what my reason was. When I was growing up, I never denied the existence of God. We just didn't talk about God in my family. And we did belong to this little church, and we did go on Easter and Christmas, and I really enjoyed that. Every once in a while, my folks would get a burr in their side and decide, we're going to church. And so sometime in between those two holidays, we would get dressed up on a Sunday morning. It was a really little church, and it was in our neighborhood. I got to tell you, the combination of a really little church and rarely attending, that is not a good combination at all. <laughs> So we'd be all dressed up for church, and we'd walk up to those double doors, and we'd walk in, and there was the minister, and he was a very nice man, and he would shake our hands and welcome us. And we'd be walking through the foyer, just this little foyer, you know, that little sanctuary is just right there. And I swear, every time this happened, before we got to the sanctuary, somebody would say, would say something like, well, look who's here. It's the Lentz. Why, we haven't seen you in ages. Welcome back to church. And I just wanted to, I mean, I felt like all eyes were on us for all the wrong reasons. It was so uncomfortable. See, Easter and Christmas Eve weren't like that. It was a zoo in that place. It was full. You could slip in and slip out without people seeing you. And the problem is, I had come over my lifetime to understand that's what church people are like. That's what I thought church people were like. The people who kind of lived at the church and were there ready to pounce on you when you showed up, you know? <laughs> so it was really important to me that this be a big church and that I could come and go as I pleased and I could absolutely stay on the periphery. I did not want to become entangled in mission or ministry or church people. I just didn't want that to happen. And you might be surprised how many people in the church, not for that reason, but for a lot of different reasons, have this desire to go to worship, 
this desire to maybe take a class or two, this desire to kind of come and go, but to not really become entangled in ministry, entangled in mission, entangled with church people. That's fine. I want you to know that's absolutely fine. We absolutely have to let people grow in their faith at their own speed. That is so terribly important, and I think this church does a wonderful job at that. People who maybe become members of the church out of a sense of duty rather than desire, and given the time to be able to go at their own speed, they end up coming to worship more and more often, maybe out of desire and not so much out of duty, and then, and then maybe start taking a, a class here or there, maybe decide to become a member of the church and get to know, I don't know, just a couple people. That's a wonderful beginning to a faith journey in the church, a wonderful beginning. But the thing is, we can get into that place and remain kind of in the position of observer and the problem is, that becomes a pretty comfortable place to be. That's what happened to me. I'm speaking firsthand. That, that is how I was. I was on the periphery for a long time, coming and going as I wanted to, not becoming really, truly engaged in the church. And the problem is, when you're in the church and you get comfortable, <laughs> you can kind of get stuck. Comfortable feels pretty good. And you can get stuck and not even know you're stuck, not even realize that this is going on. And the thing is, you know, that's not really where you want to stay. I mean, it's comfortable, so you might think, well, yes, I do. But, but actually, no, you don't. You really don't want to stay there. And you know, some of you may be thinking right now, hey, what is she talking about? You know, I attend worship. I go to an occasional class. I know some people. Gee whiz, what more do you want? What more is there? Well, let's look at our scripture. This scripture has a couple things going on in it. Jesus and his disciples are on their way to Jerusalem for the last time, and I think Jesus is tense. He's grumpy Jesus in this. Yeah, definitely. It starts out that he um, sends a couple messengers ahead to the Samaritan village to see if they might extend hospitality. Jesus and his disciples, when they are on the road, they depend on the hospitality of others for food and drink and a place to sleep. Now, you've got to remember the Samaritans and the Jews are not friends. They're actually enemies. But see, Jesus is different. And because this Samaritan village is on the way to Jerusalem, I think there's a possibility that some of those Samaritans have heard Jesus speak before. Maybe he's even been to their village before. Maybe they've had hospitality there before. It's possible. So he sends these messengers ahead, and when they find out that Jesus is heading for Jerusalem, they say no. Part of the reason might be is that Jesus is determined to get there. And you know, when Jesus comes to your village and you offer hospitality, man, the longer Jesus stays, the better, right? Chances are the messengers said, you know what, I'm sorry, we're going to be getting in late. We need food, we need drink, we need a place to sleep, and we're going to be out of here first thing in the morning. It's possible and we're heading for Jerusalem, the capital city of the enemy. What do you say? They said no. And that's not, that's not a surprise, and I don't even think that's the point of this part of the scripture. I think the point is, when the disciples James and John learned of it, they said, Master, do you want us to call a bolt of lightning down out of the sky and incinerate them? I love that. I love that. That's compassion. And Jesus, <laughs> Jesus turns on, he turns on them. The way this is worded is he turns on them and he says, of course not. Do you know, he, he's thinking, do you know how close we are to the end? Have you learned nothing? I just think he is incredibly frustrated. They go on to the next village where we can assume they got the hospitality that they needed. So what happens after this is, you know, when Jesus and his disciples are on the road, he is doing some preaching and teaching and healing as he goes along. I mean, he's going to do that. And people will come from around and hear him speak, maybe for the first time, maybe see him heal, maybe, you know, and some of them feel a tug to become a disciple, a tug to follow him. And so what's happening here, he's got three different people who are genuinely interested in becoming disciples of his. 
And so on the road, it says someone asked if he could go along. This guy said to Jesus, I'll go with you wherever. And Jesus was curt with him. He was short with him. He said, are you ready to rough it? We don't stay in the best inns, you know. Ouch. Ouch. So let's just remember that tone as we move on to the next part. Jesus comes up to another and says to him, follow me. And this person responds, certainly, but first excuse me for a couple of days, please. I have to make arrangements for my father's funeral. Jesus refused. First things first, your business is life, not death, and life is urgent. Announce God's kingdom. What? Seriously? This doesn't make any sense. This does not make any sense. Because a good Jewish son's responsibility would be, if his father had died, to make sure he was buried and in one day, and then there would be a year of mourning. This was the godly thing to do. This was the faithful thing to do. What is going on here? This doesn't make any sense. There are times we want to dig into scripture. There's times we want to dig and, and pull it away and find all the little treasures and the secrets and what the words mean and all that kind of stuff. And there are times when we need to take a bird's eye view. And I think this scripture deserves a bird's eye view. We need to be looking at this in a more of a general overall sense. This doesn't make any sense unless Jesus is exaggerating to make a point. And throughout the four gospels, we find different places throughout all of those gospels where Jesus exaggerates to make a point. It's not meant to be taken literally, it is meant to be taken seriously. And that is where we are at here. Because we go on to the last example, another said to him, to Jesus, I'm ready to follow you, Master, but first excuse me while I get things straightened out at home. I, I figure he didn't hear the interaction between <laughs> he and the last guy. He must have missed that. And Jesus said, Jesus said, no procrastination, no backward looks. You can't put God's kingdom off till tomorrow. Seize the day. Seriously? I mean, this man is willing to become his disciple and follow him. Is there not a possibility that he is the breadwinner for his family? Is there not a possibility that he's supporting parents or that he's married and he has kids or that he's got a job in the village where people truly depend on him? And what? He's not supposed to go back and let them know that he's going to be gone for an undetermined amount of time. He's just what? Supposed to disappear. I don't think so unless Jesus is exaggerating to make a point, and he is. He's exaggerating to make a point, and the point is this. Following Jesus, being a disciple of Jesus Christ is challenging. It is challenging, make no mistake. It is challenging, it is risk-taking, it's rewarding, and it's life-transforming, but it is not comfortable and rarely ever convenient. Think about what Jesus offers his disciples in the three years that they are doing ministry together. Companionship, God's love and grace. But it is never his objective in all that time to make his disciples comfortable. That's not what it's about. We need to keep in mind that real, real discipleship, when we're ready for it, real discipleship presents itself to us, tugs at our hearts, and is uncomfortable and is not convenient most of the time. Opportunities come. You're intrigued. Let's take the example of Habitat for Humanity. We do that at this church. Somebody comes into this church and they've been thinking about Habitat for a long time. There it is, right in front of them. It's, oh yeah, I want to do that. You're intrigued. You're drawn to it. And then you think, but I don't know what I'm doing. But I want to do it but I don't have the time, but I want to do it. But it, and there's this whole big tug of war going on inside of you. It's this big step. It's this big commitment. And you do all this back and forth. It's this transitional place that you're in. God is pulling you in and you're pulling out and you just, you want to, and then you're pulling back. And the thing is, if you overthink it, and we so often do this, you will convince yourself you're not qualified. If you overthink it, you'll convince yourself your faith isn't deep enough. And in essence, at that moment, you'll be saying to Jesus, excuse me, please, while I observe 
a while longer. Let me just follow you from a distance, just a little while longer. And that opportunity for discipleship is missed. And it happens to us all the time. And the thing is, these challenging, intriguing opportunities, I've been talking about what it's like when you're first entering into that kind of faith journey in a church. But this stuff happens throughout your journey, right? There's that usually that first big, big risk that you take, you remember it, right? But it continues to happen throughout our faith journey. We're getting a tug to do something, and we really can't figure out why. And we push back, but we're tugged back again, and it's not convenient and it's not comfortable, but gosh, it sounds amazing. And we go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And sometimes we must simply just have the nerve to move forward. And when we do, when we take on that challenge, it is, it is challenging and it is risk-taking and rewarding and life-transforming and it's like you take a quantum leap in your faith journey, and nearly all of you know what that's about. And how long has it been since that's happened to you? How long has, that been, has it been since you felt that way? Or maybe you've never had an experience like that. When was the last time you felt challenged by ministry in the church? I mean really challenged. Drawn, but challenged. Drawn. And you're doing that whole transitional, that whole kind of tug of war within yourself. It's not time yet. In a little while. Do you know how many times when we have Disciple Bible uh, sign-ups in, in late summer, how many people will say, I've been thinking about that for about five years, and I think next year I'm going to sign up, you know? <laughs> it's like, whoa, come on now, come on now. And when people do end up taking Disciple 1, it's just an example, but when they do, it is a life-transforming experience, and people will tell you that. They will tell you that. Now, the interesting thing is Disciple 1 is the big risk because you don't know what you're getting into and you usually don't know the people you're going to be with. And what's interesting is, and I'm not, I'm not judging, but we, we will finish up Disciple 1 and we've become so close to one another in that class and we want to take Disciple 2 that we want to move as a group to Disciple 2, right? Because what? It's comfortable. Because it's comfortable. And you've t it, it's not wrong, it's just comfortable. And you've taken away some of the risk. And see, the greater the risk, the greater the reward. You can have other stuff going on with those covenant people. Take disciple two with a new group, you know? You can do it that way. You gotta keep challenging yourself. You gotta, you gotta understand when the thing that at one time was the life transforming experience in your life has become comfortable. That's not bad, but it's time then to open your heart and your mind up again to God and God's direction and what is the next crazy thing God is asking you to do. And I think most of you know exactly what I'm talking about. And I think probably many of you have had little things uh, tugging. There's this, there's that, there's that ministry, there's this ministry. Oh, how many times do we do this? And again, I'm not judging, okay? When I retire, then I'm gonna, you know, right? When I retire, then it, well, yeah, and, and a lot of people do. You never meet busier people than retired folks, right? Some people absolutely mean that. Some people are just wanting to follow at a distance just a little while longer. So, let's uncover these things. When, when you receive the bread and the cup tonight, you may have things that's, al that's already on your mind that you want to converse with God about at that time. If you don't, I would really encourage you to take the time to ask God, if you're not already aware, because you might be in the midst of your big challenging thing and doing it right now, but if it's been a while, ask God, where's God calling you? Where's God tugging you? You know, what, what is the next crazy thing God's going to ask you to do that's going to be a life-changing experience? You're going to meet somebody you're meant to meet, you know? You're going to have an experience that is going to be profound. It's going to bring you a whole lot of joy. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. 